Good morning. Welcome to Pocono Evangelical Free Church. I realize everyone's still coming in, but uh, we want to uh, worship the Lord together today. And we also want to mention that not only are we going to worship the Lord together today, after our worship service, we're going to be having a congregational meeting. And that's very important. We want everyone to feel invited. Uh, a congregational meeting is really about service of the Lord. And so we'll make a big circle. Um, you do not have to be a member. You have to be a member to vote, but you don't have to be a member to be here and to participate. So we wanted to invite all of you for our um, our uh, September business meeting. Uh, want to mention some needs for prayer. Uh, Miguel is home. Um, in fact, a few of us went over on Wednesday and saw him, uh, but he also... Uh, uh, suffered a heart attack, mm -hmm. he has a uh, urinary tract infection, and pneumonia, so continue to pray for him. Um, uh, Georgia is going to be having surgery. It's good to see you, Georgia. Um, her tendon separated from, from your hip all the way down to your thigh. Wow, from the bone. So she's going to be having surgery on, on Tuesday. I'm, a, I'm amazed you're even walking and able to get here. So, uh, but uh, let's uh, pray for Georgia concerning that. Um, Sam, you're not going to know anything until October 4th, but continue to pray. He's meeting with the doctors to uh, consider how to treat the cancer at that point in time. Um, want to also mention Terry and um, Alan will be going back to Arizona uh, with Alan's immobility. We want to pray for uh, him and uh, Terry to get back there. Um, and then um, continue to pray for for Homer, and then Dave mentioned he's having nosebleeds again, so he was at the doctor on. So continue to pray for all that stuff going on with Dave. Uh, want to mention, we have our online service at 6.30 this evening, uh, Wednesday Bible study at uh, 6.30. Um, growth groups, we're sorry we had to cancel today. Uh, Pastor JG came down with a cold. Um, I was teaching, in fact, I left the house at nine yesterday, didn't get home till nine, so I was teaching a grad class. Uh, down at Karen. Um, so we just felt like the only solution at that point was to uh, to cancel uh, Pastor JJ uh, and I decided that. So sorry about that. Uh, sorry for those of you who didn't get the message. We did try to get it out. Um, uh, want to mention um, that it's Paul Lozier's birthday. I don't know when, but 28th. 28th. Um, so let's go to worship together. So I'm going to need, you, need your help today because my voice is not what it usually is. So if you guys want to stand, if you want to sit, whatever you want to do for worship. But if you could sing out with me, that'd be great.
be seated. Want to consider something as uh, we've invited all of you to come to our congregational meeting. I realize there's a lot more people that have come in. So let me just mention right after service, we're having a congregational meeting, which is part of worshiping and serving the Lord is to, to have uh, a opportunity to make the decisions that pertain to the church. And you do not have to be a member to come and to participate. You have to be a member to vote. But And uh, we would encourage you, if you're not a member, to consider that also. Uh, but I thought it would be very pertinent to read for us Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, as we come together to make decisions that affect uh, the church body. Uh, Paul says, therefore, if, so he uses the word if, saying, if there is any consolation in Christ. Is there comfort in Christ, people? Amen. Say amen. amen. All right. He says, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort or love. Yes. Can we say amen? amen. In Christ there is. Um, if any fellowship of the Spirit. Amen. 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 If any affection and mercy. Aren't you glad what Paul was saying, if, is true? But then he challenges us. And he says, fulfill my joy by being. So if this is true, this is what we should be as we congregate and make decisions concerning the church. Have the same love. Be of one accord, of one mind. Isn't that powerful? Because these things are true, we unify as a congregation in making our decisions. There's a basket in the back for tithes and offerings. Uh, that's part of our worship. We encourage you uh, to give as the Lord leads you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for just that reminder of oneness. Because there is consolation in Christ. There is comfort. There is love. There is fellowship. There are all these things, including mercy. And help us as we congregate after to make the decisions of the church to truly be of one mind and of the same spirit and, and to care about one another and to be unified in the spirit of God. Uh, we pray for the needs among us. Lord, we pray for Miguel. We thank you full that he's home from the hospital. But as he continues uh, to recover from the heart attack, um, as the medication for the UTI and the pneumonia um, are, are there, we pray that there would be healing. Uh, we pray for your grace with all the other uh, physical problems and challenges he faces also. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for uh, Georgia, Lord, and that she's here this morning, even after her tendons have separated uh, from her bone. And we pray as they do surgery on Tuesday that the surgery would really rectify that problem. Uh, we pray, Lord, for uh, Sam as he waits the news from the doctor about how to treat the cancer, that you would give him both patience and grace. Uh, we pray, pray, continue to pray for Homer and his battle against cancer. Uh, we pray for uh, Terry and Alan, Lord, as they make preparations to go back to Arizona for the winter, uh, that you would give extra mercy to, to Alan and mobility even as he has to make the trip back. Uh, we just uh, commit these many things, and oh Lord, also Dave, we thank you that he's here today, and as uh, the, the nose bleeding has reoccurred and some of the other uh, concerns, we just lift him up and pray for your grace and protection in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 i 
right. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2. And if you want to get ready, also keep your finger in Acts chapter 2. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do my best here today. This week has been a rough week for me <laughs> in a lot of different ways. I, you can tell my voice is not quite right. I actually am having a hard time hearing out of this ear. There's all kinds of random things going on with me. So, you know, I just pray that the Lord would use me even despite the, me not being at 100%. And I'm just thankful that it's not based on me, right? It's based on the Word of God. And that's what we're here to talk about and think about. So I'm uh, just looking forward to continuing to talk about that. If you remember, uh, we were talking about uh, Joel chapter 2. We had started in verse 28 and uh, looked at how Peter used this passage uh, to begin his first sermon in Acts chapter 2. Uh, so we're going to be looking at both passages. So uh, like I said, if you have your fingers in Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at both passages. But let's start in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Today we're going to be looking at verse 30 to 32, but let's start in verse 28. It says, It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirits on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. And again, looking at Acts chapter 2, this is what Paul says in his sermon. Obviously, a lot of similarities here, but some slight differences. Uh, Paul said, uh, Peter says, And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams, even on the bond slaves, both men and women. And I will put, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day the Lord, uh, of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Father, as we can, as we can uh, consider this text and the importance of it in our lives, as we consider the importance of our salvation, and that it's by the name of Jesus that we may be saved. Lord, I pray that this sermon would be impactful to our hearts and our lives as we consider our great salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week has been one of those weeks where there's so many things that hit me in so many different ways. Not all bad necessarily, but definitely, uh, definitely lots of different things that happened. Um, I... Uh, on Tuesday, we were uh, up in Dallas, Pennsylvania, so I was busy doing some stuff with uh, fellow pastors uh, in the Evangelical Free. On Tuesday, we were rushing down uh, to CHOP because we had found out that we needed to have an appointment before Vera's surgery that we needed at two months before the surgery, and we didn't know about it. And so we needed to rush down, so we did that on Tuesday. Wednesday. Or Wednesday, thank you. We, we, uh, we left and we didn't get back until Bible study, so that was a full day right there. Uh, Thursday was, uh, was a good day. We did uh, some things, uh, uh, celebrated Sarah's birthday at Streamside and did some other things like that, but it was a busy day. On Friday, I started noticing I, I'm not feeling well. And I had known because Rachel wasn't feeling well, and Dana wasn't feeling well earlier, and Vera hadn't felt well at one point in time, and I was just like, ah, I hope it's not a big deal. Now, when they got it, they seemed to get over it real quick, so I thought, mm -hmm. oh, okay, maybe this is not a big deal. But I remember just being Friday in a fog, trying to write this sermon, trying to figure everything out, and I'm just like, Lord, help me out here, you know, like, deliver me here, you know? That's what this passage says, deliver me here. And on Saturday, I had three sessions. And I was still working on my sermon, and I just felt like in a fog. And I just was like, man, this is difficult. Last night, sorry, last night I woke up at 2.40. 
with a piercing headache, and I couldn't sleep, so I took some stuff and uh, was able to finally sleep uh, after, at around 3.40. But it's just one of those days, you know? <clears throat> I gotta say, I'm so thankful the Lord delivered me from a bad headache because I thought, what if I have to preach with this headache? This is gonna be awful. <laughs> but I don't have a headache right now, so praise the Lord for that, right? But it's just one of those days where it's like, sometimes you're just like, Lord, can you just like deliver me from this? Save me from this? <laughs> Obviously, whatever situations you have in your life, no matter what difficulties <coughs> you're dealing with, remember this. God has delivered you from the greatest issues of all. When we talk about the deliverance of God, his deliverance that he did through his son Jesus on the cross for our sins is the greatest deliverance there is in human history. And that's something we're here to think about and talk about. You know, before we get into that, we do notice in the first two verses that it talks about that the Lord will display these wonders. <coughs> so we're going to look at that now in verse uh, uh, 30 and 31. Uh, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, as well as who uh, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, are important messages for Peter to give at, on the day of Pentecost. Remember, Peter's using this as saying, hey, this is a fulfillment of what Joel said, right? So that's what Peter's saying in Acts chapter 2. And, you know, these two things make sense. The fact that the pouring out of the Holy Spirit happened. Remember what happened at Pentecost. And they were, they were speaking and, and people could understand them in their own languages. And it was a miracle. It was amazing. And, and they were confused. What's going on? And Peter had to explain. Well, remember what, what Joel said. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit. That's this. And it's also really important that Peter quotes uh, this last passage that we'll look at later in my second point about whoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why? Because Peter's point in his sermon is to point to whose name should you call on? Amen. It's Jesus, the one who has been raised from the dead and the one who is God. That's ultimately the whole point of his sermon in a nutshell, right? So, so these are, are, are pretty important for him to quote, and it makes sense that he would quote the whole passage in context. However, these two verses seem to be right before the day of the Lord. And obviously this starts getting into, because was, was this, did this happen? Did, the, did the, the sun stop shining? Did the moon turn to blood? Were there signs of, of blood and uh, of fire and of smoke? Did all those things already happen when Peter's saying that at that time? And so you can imagine, this is where so many people start getting into a conversation. And you have the amillennialists who might, you know, try to say, well, you know, the, the, the signs in the sky might be the star of Bethlehem over Jesus. Or, you know, you have these, these things where they start trying to come up with, with what these signs could have meant. Uh, for some who are premillennial, like myself, you might say, well, no, this is, this is, this is probably for the, the final day, the, the day of the Lord that is a future date. <clears throat> but then why is Peter using this text too, right? Why does he repeat these two verses if it hasn't happened right at that time? So you can imagine that a lot of people have a lot of debate, a lot of conversation uh, about these things. It does seem to have a fulfillment if, uh, that is for the future. And I still make that point about Joel, as I've made to you before, and I still make it today, that there is a future fulfillment to this, I believe, as well. So, uh, but, but, uh, but uh, we have Guzik who says this, on the day of Pentecost, the prophecy of Joel was fulfilled, but not consummated. Peter rightly saw that this was a remarkable outpouring of the Spirit of God, given freely upon all who believe and receive. So according to Guzik, and as you, many of you know, Guzik is more of a premillennial uh, commentator. He, he makes the point that, that yes, this was fulfilled, but it wasn't completely uh, consummated is the word he uses here. So even with this portion of, uh, uh, so when was this portion of, pro uh, of Joel's prophecy fulfilled? Did it take place at Pentecost? Now, this is where you get some people saying the day of the Lord is when Jesus died on the cross and rose again. And so when that happened, that's the, that's the day of the Lord. And, uh, but then that kind of re rejects the idea, well, where's the terror? Where's all those other things that we see in regards to the day of the Lord? So there's lots of confusion, uh, maybe confusion is the wrong word, there's lots of debate that goes among this day of Lord. We've talked about that already, I don't need to get back into that, but it is something to be uh, aware of. 
The consensus that I've read of all millennial commentators believe that the fulfillment of this uh, was happened at the point of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Many of the amillennialists that I read, they would argue that this all happened in 70 AD at the fall of the, uh, at the uh, in the fall of Jerusalem. Now, to me, as many of you know, this is not satisfactory to me. Uh, if you hold to that view, that's fine. We can have lots of conversations. We don't need to divide over it. But uh, but to me, I believe that there is a future fulfillment of this. Some suggest a double fulfillment. In fact, uh, Poole here suggests that. He says this was fulfilled partly in the devastation of Jerusalem, but shall fully and finally be fulfilled in the day of judgment and at the consummation of the world. So Poole takes the approach that it's a double fulfillment. Yes, it happened uh, in 70 AD with Jerusalem, but it's also got a future fulfillment as well. So whatever your position is, whatever your perspective is, here's my hope. My hope is that we could agree that there is a future fulfillment to this that seems to be there. This goes very much back to what I said way back when we studied uh, chapter 2 at the very beginning. And I mentioned the day of the Lord mentioned twice in that text. And I gave you all those scriptures. I gave you too many scriptures. I couldn't cover it all. Uh, so this kind of goes back to some of those things that we already have talked about. <clears throat> Even if this is a fulfillment uh, of something that has happened in the past, it seems clear that there's also a future fulfillment. So let's look at a couple scriptures that we didn't get to look at in regards to the day of the Lord. Let's start in Isaiah chapter 13. By the way, I'm not reading all these scriptures. I just have them all uh, up there for you. But uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 13. <clears throat> So Isaiah chapter 13, starting in verse 6. Jay, yeah. You might want to mention if they don't know what premillennial or amillennial is to come to the growth groups. Oh yeah, that's right. If you yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> if you're curious, what is amillennial and pre-premillennial? Uh, uh, that is something we will be talking about in growth groups uh, on our Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Again, I, I'm so sorry that we uh, did not do that today. That was not intentional. Uh, it just was one of those days where things were not working out for us. But we are planning on getting to the premillennial issue. And so if that's something you're interested in, that's going to be coming up in our growth groups. Thank you, Dad. All right, so uh, this is what Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6 says. It says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It shall come as a as destruction from the Almighty. Before all hand, uh, therefore, all hands will fall limp, and every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them, and they will writhe like a woman in labor, and they will look at one another in astonishment, their faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. And the sun will be darkened when it rises and the moon will not shed its light. Now, this is another scripture that is specifically talking about the day of the Lord. And you see many different signs in here. My focus wasn't to look at every little detail of this passage, but to notice what it says specifically of the sun and the moon. Doesn't what it happens with the sun and moon. That matches what Joel is saying. In his text, doesn't it? Right? That the sun will be darkened, that the moon won't give light, or in Joel it said talks about the moon will 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 uh, will be like a will, will, will be like blood. <clears throat> also, Joel mentions this on a few different occasions. In fact, we already looked at it in Joel chapter two, verse ten, where it says, "Be." Um, uh, uh, before the uh, before them the earth quakes the heavens tremble the sun and the moon grow dark and the stars lose their brightness and then in verse 11 it mentions the day of the lord so we've already kind of seen that in chapter 2 verse uh, 11 obviously we have it here in verse 31 it's also mentioned in chapter 3 verse 15 where it says the sun and the moon grow dark and their stars lose their brightness and this is in regards to uh the valley of decision we're going to get there we're not there yet but we'll get there in chapter 3 as joel mentions that Okay. Also, Jesus mentions this in these three passages. Obviously, uh, they're, they're the Synoptic Gospels. They're, they're telling a lot of similar stories. But the main one I want to look at is Matthew chapter 24. So turn there to Matthew chapter 24. Again, you can look also at Luke chapter 21 and Mark 
chapter 13. But this is pretty significant because uh, Jesus actually quotes from the book of Joel here. It's actually a quotation there. So this is chapter 24, verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of heavens will be shaken and then the sun the sign of the son of man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory and he will send forth his angels with the tr with the great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So, look, there's lots more we can talk about. But one of the things I wanted just to note, in just these few scriptures that we look at, and there's more out there, you see that in, contra uh, in connection with the day of the Lord is this idea of the sun losing its light, being darkened, and the moon either losing light as well or turning to blood, right? These are things that are consistent when we see the day of the Lord and the scripture describing that. So, it, did this happen on any given day in history? Again, this is where I think it needs to be a future day. Uh, many people that don't believe it's a future day have to kind of ultimately say that this is allegorical for something. That this, that this didn't actually happen. It, it's allegorical for the doom of the destruction of Jerusalem or something along those lines. I take the approach, and many of you know, that I believe that we should take the Bible literally, and therefore, when did this happen literally? I don't know that we should necessarily take this as allegorical. And so, therefore, that's why I conclude that this should be a future day of the Lord. Because it's mentioned time and time again, the details are consistent. If it's allegorical, why does it keep saying it over and over again in the same way? Even Jesus talks about this after the tribulation, when the Son of Man will come, this is what's going to happen to the sun. This is what's going to happen to the moon. You also see other signs in the book of Joel uh, uh, that were that are, that's in our text. Signs in the sky, signs that are on the earth. We see blood, we see fire, we see columns of smoke. We see the sun turning into darkness and the moon into blood. And there seems to be a lot of consistency on the details of the signs of the day of the Lord. So there's no reason that I believe we should consider this allegorical with the details agreeing like they do. Also notice, and I think this is one of the most significant things I'd like to point out, notice the change of the way it describes or, or speaks to the day of the Lord. We've seen Joel say the day of the Lord multiple times, but in our text here, it doesn't say just the day of the Lord. It says the great and awesome day of the Lord. Notice how it's translated in the New Testament. It's the great and glorious day of the Lord. Maybe your translations have a different word there, but the New American Standard uses both the word awesome and it uses the word glorious in Acts uh, as well. And, and so even though we believe that this is still the same day, it's another word describing <clears throat> what that day is going to be like. It's going to be awesome and glorious. Now, we also know it's going to be a terrible day of the Lord. Because many times when it talks about the day of the Lord, it talks about the terrible day of the Lord. So you have lots of different words. And I think that what we talked about last time sh still should uh, really stand, right? That it's going to be awesome and glorious for those who are in Christ, who have the blood of Jesus applied to them, and they see we see Jesus, our Messiah and our King, coming to the earth for judgment and to make things right. That is a glorious and awesome day. But for anyone who is not in Christ, this is a day of utter terror and horror. So it leads us to that question, are we in Christ? Are we in Christ? There's clearly a focus on the day of the Lord, and even Peter recognized it as he quotes from it. So with this in mind, in regards to the day of the Lord, points of application, in regards to the great and awesome day of the Lord, three things for us today. The first is this, trust what God says. I struggle with, and if you are of the amillennial perspective, I'd love to talk. I'd love to have conversations because I, I'm actually really interested in that position, even though I don't necessarily agree with it. I, I, I'd love to know how do you take those and make that allegorical. That's something I'm curious about, right? But, but if the Lord says, "Hey, this is what's going to happen," doesn't it make sense for us to say, 
we believe that's what's going to happen, right? So it's something that I think we need to remember, especially when it comes to future days that have not happened yet. What's going to happen? Well, we trust what God says is going to happen. So trust what God says. Secondly, make sure that you're right with God. You do not want to face the day of the Lord and not be right with the Lord. And it also should mean that we should care for those who are in our lives because they may not be ready for the day of the Lord. And so we should also be considering them and helping them to know the gospel, to hear the gospel, so that they can be right with God. And thirdly, be ready. Be ready. So with these things in mind, that leads us to one of the great points that Peter is trying to make. Whoever calls... On the name of the Lord will be saved. This statement in verse 32 is, 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 is an essential verse for the gospel. And it's also why Peter uh, didn't just stop at, you know, that the God is pouring forth the spirit. Joel makes an incredible statement that should have, I, I imagine, confused many people at that time. And Peter is saying, this is the fulfillment of this. This is the fulfillment of anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's break this down a little bit. The first is this. It says in our text in verse 32, and it will come about that whoever calls, whoever calls. This is a universal. Uh, you notice in, uh, in uh, Acts it says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. In Joel, it's whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Both words make it very clear that this is very uh, uh, open. It's intended, uh, obviously prophetically, uh, of the Gentiles, right? So that the Gentiles would also be included, right? And we see this happen later in the book of Acts, where the Gentiles are able to come to Christ. So you could, could certainly say that's what it's referring to. But I would also uh, uh, suggest, if you will, I know this is a divisive uh, uh, issue for many people, but I would also suggest that it does not say something like this. Therefore, if any of the elect call, they will be saved. It says whoever. Now, if you're a strong Calvinist, I'm not trying to ruffle your feathers at all. That's not my goal. But at the same time, I think that the Calvinist has to wrestle with this word that's used here. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, we could argue the theology of that. I'm not trying to, like I said, there's definitely different points that we could argue. But I think it's significant that that word is used. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. There are those, ultimately, who will not call. And you can argue the Calvinist uh, Arminian debate there. But I think one of the things that we need to understand, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord is going to be incredibly blessed. They get salvation. This is a wonderful gift. How dreadful it would be to, be, to not be one of the whoever's. Whether it was because you're elect or not. Regardless, that's kind of the almost... A side point to some degree, listen, we want to be one of the whoever's. Amen. We want to be one of the whoever's, one of the everyone's who calls on the name of the Lord. To miss out on this wonderful gift would be tragedy. So it's whoever, whoever calls, whoever calls on the Lord. This word uh, calls, uh, it involves this idea of crying out to God. In fact, Joel has already used this word call uh, two other times. If you notice in chapter 1, verse 14, Joel says, Con uh, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. That's another place that Joel's used this word to cry. Also in verse 19, to you, O Lord, I cry. So Paul, uh, so, so uh, Joel has already uh, used this word uh, about crying out to God. It's this idea of prayer. Of, uh, and by the way, has prayer, any, has prayer ever hurt anyone's life? <laughs> right? No, prayer is always a good thing when you're communicating with God. No one ever died by praying, right? Prayer is a good thing. And yet sometimes we're so resistant to prayer. And it's an unfortunate thing. Joel has already talked about this importance of crying out to God. 
And Joel's saying, listen, if you cry out to God, there's hope. Remember, I told you, Joel is a book of hope. Anyone who cries out to the Lord can be delivered, can be saved. I'm going to skip over real quick. Whoever calls on the name, we'll look at the name in a minute. But look at of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. This needs to be the true God. It's not enough to just cry out to any God. <laughs> Make sense? It has to be the right and true God. Prayer needs to be directed in the right place. Oh, I'm, I'm a man of prayer, someone says, right? <laughs> well, who do you pray to? <laughs> if it's not God, it's worthless. True. Prayer needs to be directed in the right place. Spurgeon says this. He says, what can be more wicked than to attempt to imagine a better God than the one true and living God. As the deity of your fancy has no existence, I would not recommend you trust in him. I love how Spurgeon kind of says that, right? The God of your fancy doesn't even exist. Pray to the one true God, the only God. There are many counterfeits. There's only one true God. And our crying needs to be placed in the only one who has authority and power to save. So we cry out to the Lord in the name, we, we, uh, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, the name. There is an understanding of who God is here. And as we look specifically at what Peter's trying to say, Peter's using this in a way to reveal what name are we talking about? In fact, if you study uh, Acts chapter 2 a little bit more out, uh, I don't have a lot of time to get into it, uh, but notice how he, where he goes from there. Uh, right at the end of verse 21, he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene. Look how he immediately transitioned. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus! He goes right next to Jesus right there. And he starts talking about Jesus. And then you notice how he speaks specifically of the resurrection. Using Old Testament passages to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus that was said in the Old Testament. This, this is Jesus who fills the resurrection. And then after talking about the resurrection, Peter's focus then shifts to this idea of that Jesus is deity. As he uses the quotation in verse 34, the Lord said to my Lord. Well, how can the Lord say to my Lord? Unless the Lord is also the Lord, right? And the idea is that Jesus is God, right? That's Peter's argument. He is building upon what Joel has said. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What's that name? That name is Jesus. Here's who Jesus is. That is how Peter is using Joel to evangelize and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Clark says this. Oh, I didn't have it written down. Sorry, guys. Uh, Clark says this. Nor is there salvation in any other. And those who reject him had better lay these things to heart before it is too late. There is salvation in no other name. This quotation from Joel is setting up who Jesus is. What name can save? Peter will use this point in his text. And the whole point is to, is to recognize that it is the name of Jesus that saves. So whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, the name being Jesus the Lord being the one true God, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. In our text, it might say delivered. <laughs> Obviously, we see as it talks about in uh, Peter's text, it says it uses the word saved. Guzik says this. He said, Peter also used this passage from Joel to be to, to an ambit. Sorry. Excuse me. Peter also used this passage from Joel to an evangelistic purpose. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit meant that God now offered salvation in a way previously unknown. In fact, when Joel's hearers maybe heard this, this might have confused them as to what exactly Joel was talking about. But Peter is now taking this text in Joel and saying, let me explain to you what this is about. 
It's about salvation. To be saved from sin. Saved by the blood of Jesus. Saved because of the great work of Jesus. What a profound and amazing promise that God reveals through his prophet Joel. And now in Acts we see that fulfillment being Jesus. Paul also uses the same quotation in Romans chapter 10. Let's look at Romans chapter 10 quickly. Romans chapter 10. This is also an evangelistic uh, uh, statement here that you will notice in verse 13. And whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's straight from Joel right there. But then he continues, and how will they call on, uh, on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Notice how Paul uses this whole context of Joel to point out that we need to go out. We need to be sent. We need to preach. We need to tell others of the good news of Jesus Christ. So even Paul uses Joel for this evangelistic purpose. Peter is not done using this context either, as you see in Acts chapter 4. Just a couple chapters after uh, Peter preaches this sermon, in Acts chapter 4, uh, they, heal, uh, <clears throat> they heal a lame beggar. And they get in trouble. They get arrested in chapter 4. And in chapter 4, they bring Peter and the others to, to uh, uh, pr pretty much they're trying to get them to stop preaching Jesus. That's what they want, right? And look at what it says in chapter 4, starting in verse 5. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Ananias, the high priest, was there. And Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all those who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or in what name have you done this? Notice that. What name have you done this? Verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we just talked about that last time, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Here we see Peter. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are on, on trial today for a, for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how... This man had been made well. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. Is there any question about which name this is? Verse 11, he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which, uh, but, but which became the chief cornerstone. And then he, Peter says this, what a powerful verse this is. Verse 12, chapter 4, and there is salvation in no one else. And there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name given under heaven by which men may be saved. Not only is it very clear which name Peter is referring to here, makes it very clear that it's Jesus. He also takes it a step further and says there's no other way to salvation. There is no other salvation that can be found anywhere else but by the name of Jesus. But man, let me tell you, that's not a message people like to hear in our culture today. That's for sure. But man, if it be true, then it's a message we need to preach loudly. Peter is bold and clear. There is salvation in no one else, no other name. Salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. The end of our text in Joel, it does continue talking. Notice that it's not mentioned in Acts chapter 2. Uh, maybe Peter felt it, that was the right place to end it. Uh, that's really his point, right? That it's the name of Jesus that saves. So there's not really much reason to continue on. Obviously, with chapter divisions, those were, those were put in there for us to find where verses were. They, they don't necessarily end at that point. So uh, you, you do have that. But you notice at the very end, for on Mount Zion... And in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said. 
even among the survivors whom the Lord has called. Again, people start debating. Is this 70 AD where people were able to escape? Is this a future day? <laughs> we keep going back to those debates, don't we? <laughs> Does it go back to a future day? Is it, is it in the past? Either way. Peter, does, uh, Peter doesn't focus on this. Peter's focus is on the name which saves. Yes. It's not necessary for him to continue the quote. But one thing I do want to point out, whether it's 70 AD, whether it's in the future, there is a name that saves, and that is the point that Joel is even making here, even though Peter doesn't continue it. There's a name that saves. Who's going to be saved? There might be those people that are saved uh, in the end times. That could be uh, what... Joel is referring to. Maybe it was 70 AD. Either way, the whole point is focused on Christ's salvation. Jesus Christ's salvation for those who call on the name of the Lord. So, with that in mind, Christ's salvation is, I have four points here. First is this, it's offered to all. Wherever you stand on the Calvinistic Arminian debate, listen, I'm fine having lots of conversations, and uh, I'm not saying I have it all figured out myself, you know, but I'm going to say this. I think it's very clear that it's offered. It's offered to all, and, and it's something that we need to understand. Now, uh, you know, we can have conversations not further, but when it says whoever, listen, no one's going to get up there and say, well, you see, I wasn't one of the elect, so therefore, you know, I, I should get a pass because I'm not one of the elect, right? No one's going to be able to say that. It was offered. You may have rejected it, but it was offered. And it's a call. It's a gift that is so important and valuable. We cannot reject this gift. Thirdly, or secondly, Christ's salvation is the only salvation. There is no other name given among men which by people may be saved. It's one of the great issues, I believe, that's coming up in our culture today. People would love to be able to say that there's lots of different ways. There's not. Not if you believe in the word of God. Jesus also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It's very clear. There's only one way. There's only one salvation, and that's Christ's salvation. Thirdly, Christ's salvation is sufficient. As Peter goes on to speak to the resurrection and to the deity of Jesus, what other power could save in such a way? Jesus' power to save is sufficient. It's enough because he is God and he's powerful. Because God in his ultimate plan is powerful. It is sufficient. It is good enough. His salvation is great. And thirdly, or fourthly, I just want us to remember the significance of this. Listen, I know we talk often about the gospel. We should. It's right for us to talk about the gospel. Right? But I just hope that we never lose sight of how immeasurable this gift really is. However many days you have on this earth, th there's not enough days to run out of gratefulness for the gospel. It should always impact our hearts and our souls to know that we can be saved if we cry out, if we call in, in the name of the Lord, then we can be saved. We don't deserve that. Not one of us here deserves that. And yet God has offered that. Knew he was going to offer it all the way back in Joel's day when God inspired Joel to write these words down. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's bow in meditation. <coughs> Father, we do want to thank you so much for your great salvation that you provided for, uh, for us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we recognize and we know that there is no other name given among men whereby men can be saved. It's the name of Jesus. So, Lord, help us as we consider you, as we consider your name, as we consider Christ who gave his life for us. Father, help us to truly be grateful for the immeasurable gift given to us through Jesus. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus. There's no other name that saves. Have a great day. May the Lord go with you.